Hello and welcome to the big picture. The ruling Awami League in Bangladesh has won the elections comfortably. The elections marred by the boycott by the major opposition parties, violence and low turnout is already being seen as one which lacks legitimacy. The Sheikh Hasina government had put an end to the system of caretaker administration during the elections that had been the norm since 1991. In the run-up to the elections and also on the polling day, the country witnessed widespread violence and 18 people were killed on Sunday itself. Many fears are being expressed now about what would be the repercussions of these elections and the turmoil the country has been enveloped in. Today we will discuss what these election results portend to Bangladesh in the coming years and also what impact it will have on India and the relations between the two countries. To discuss this, I have with me Nilotmal Basu, Central Committee member, CPIM, Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Dr. Baladas Goshal, Senior Fellow, Center for Policy Research, and Sandeep Dikshit, Senior Assistant Editor of the Hindu. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Chakravarti, I would like to come to you first. How legitimate is this victory for the Awami League? I think you cannot fault these elections on constitution on legal basis. Right. The elections were due as per the constitution and they were held and the election commission held the election as per the rules of laws of the land. Yes. If one party boycotts the election or one group boycotts the election, the elections do not become illegitimate. That is a political decision to boycott. It is not a constitutional or a legal requirement for the government in power to postpone any election. Nor is there the caretaker provision which was there earlier and which was being demanded by the BNP that debt should be reinstated right. because that was uh, that was expunged from the parliament by the 15th amendment so there was the, no, from the constitution from the constitution sorry by the parliamentary uh, amendment what happened is that uh, sheikh hasina was left perhaps with no other options but she tried to have a caretaker government by inviting all parties elected members of all parties to join the government which the bnp refused so there was no other alternative left but to go for these elections. Uh, Nilotpal, do you, do you see this whole thing in the, in the manner Mr. Chakravarti sees? You think that Sheikh Hasina had no other option but to go ahead despite the boycott? I think uh, much of the noise about the legitimacy of this election is coming from uh, two apparently opposed uh, uh, sections. One is the uh, fundamentalists, uh, not only in Bangladesh, but also the uh, entire Arab region, you see Al-Qaeda has threatened this government for being infidel and so on and so forth. And then there is the West, uh, especially the British and the American governments, right. which also uh, express their displeasure. Now, the problem is that uh, Sheikh Hasina was facing uh, Begum Khaleda Zia, who was uh, unprepared to part ways with the Jamaat Islami. Now, this background is when the Shabag Andolan uh, movement took place, and uh, uh, you see the international tribunal was uh, coming out with verdicts against uh, uh, war criminals, and uh, under public pressure, one of them uh, had to be actually hanged, and there are so many cases awaiting, and which incidentally also is the core leadership of Jamaat. Uh, Jamaat had no other alternative but to try and scuttle this election. Uh, to, to uh, undermine the legitimacy of the Hasina government. And the peculiarity of Bengal po Bangladesh politics is that, that though Jamaat uh, commands only 3% support among the people, they have a solid organization. Right. While B BNP is a much more uh, wider uh, support based party, but it does not have any cadre. So it is this which has made this uh, alliance to click. And uh, in the face of it, uh, um, um, Khaled Azia went along with the Jamaat and uh, did this. And therefore, I think uh, uh, what, what uh, has happened, uh, of course, it will create some problems. But at the same time, I think in a way it was inevitable. Professor Goshal, was it inevitable? You no, know, the, the, it's, it's very interesting as Nilotpal was pointed out, <coughs> disparate elements coming together, having, you know, talking in the same language. Mr. Chakravarti says that, you know, it is it was um, inevitable that she went ahead and uh, 
did this era, went ahead with the elections. But the, but the fact of the matter is, on the ground, the kind of impact, the kind of mayhem and violence which we are seeing, what does it mean? In fact, this was anticipated. This kind of violence was anticipated because Bangladesh politics had never been free from violence. Right. And uh, in fact, uh, both the parties somehow uh, had engaged in violence all throughout their political career. So the violence is almost sort of, you know, endemic with the Bangladesh political system. But as Mr. Chakravarti says that Hasina didn't have an alternative either, because it's a situation, damn if you do, I mean, damn, damn if, if you don't. don't. Because after all, the elections had to take place. Mm. And it is not that she was not uh, working for an alternative solution as well, in the sense of having a caretaker government, but not of the type as uh, uh, Mrs. Zia had asked for, right. but at least, you know, consisting of representatives from political parties. It's a political party kind of caretaker government. Because the earlier experience of caretaker government, although it did quite a bit of cleaning of the system. Cleaning and, you know, if you look at the last elections, the, pers the kind of turnout of people and all was pretty good. 70% came out and voted in the last in 2008 elections and now we see this kind of just 22% turnout. But this time the political situation was very different. Right. Because, you know, as other speakers have also no, What I meant to say is, that would, was that caretaker administration responsible for that kind of a turnout? And it was seen, last election was seen largely as a fair, free and fair election. No, no. You see, the political background was quite different at that time. I mean, this question of tribunal, you know, war criminals, all this thing didn't come up. Right. And the Jamaat was not on defensive as it is today. Right. And as both Mr. Bose and Mr. Chakravarti had mentioned, that, you know, in both these cases, you know, Jamaat played an important role. Right. And they were on the defensive this time. So that's after why the, they were the, the ones who... After the execution of their leader. Right, right. Last, last right, month. Right, right. That's... Right. Okay, uh, Mr. Chakravarti. Yes, I would just want to make one point about the 2008 elections. While there was a caretaker government, that was a facade. The real power brokers at that time was the army right. and the generals who were there. Mm. And as far as the Jamaat is concerned, let us not forget that after a Supreme Court verdict, which, calls, which, which, uh, which found the Jamaat Charter unconstitutional, the CEC, the election commissioner, uh, deregistered the Jamaat. So the Jamaat was not in play in terms of electoral politics anymore. And what, of course, triggered the violence was, as Baladas said, was the, was the war crimes tribunal. Right. Okay. Uh, Sandeep, Sandeep yeah. you, think, you, you think that, you know, what, what would happen to the social and political fabric of Bangladesh in the present context, in, in, in the way we are, what we are witnessing in, this, in the country there now? Yeah, what we have seen is that the, for the for the past five years, there was no common political ground between BNP and Awami League. Right. And the last six months have been very bizarre. There have been fifth columnists in Hasina's government. There's this Jamaat there. And as has been pointed out, intensive Western meddling. Right. Their attempt to prompt up NGO Wala's to contest against uh, Awami League. So there's been a lot of factors and this bizarre uh, spectacle that we saw for the past six months where the civil society was baying for hanging of people, right. asking for death sentences. So it got all, got all twisted and warped up in Bangladesh. But that's not to say that these kinds of lopsided elections uh, is uh, we are witnessing for the first time over here. I think if there is some mature statesmanship by all sections of the Bangladeshi society, the situation can be retrieved as we have retrieved several times in India. Uh, there's been very, very low polling, even lower polling than Bangladesh and Punjab in the past, Bangladesh, Manipur, Nagaland, Jammu Assam. Kishmir. So Kishmir. Uh, we are not strangers to such a situation. I suppose if India gives a helping hand and if the certain Western outfits are told not to meddle so much. In fact, uh, uh, External Affairs Mr. Salman Khurshid had said very clearly, saying that India understands Bangladesh much better because it's a neighbor. And it's better that if the US understands about Bangladesh from India rather than trying to go there and creating a new kind of uh, situation over there. Uh, Mr. Chakravarti, in fact, this this US, European Union, but the, the Brits, they all 
they all didn't send their representatives. You know, they didn't. Uh, there was no overseeing of the elections. It was a very deliberate act. Why are they taking that kind of a line? Well, they actually took a position much before. They said. Everybody must participate. Right. So when the boycott took place, which was the decision of the BNP and the Jamaat combined, then they were left in a position as to, you know, it's not an all-party election, not all everybody is participating. So they had no option but to fall back, okay, then we will no, not be a part of it. That was, that was why it happened. And the irony is that many of these countries are more, are more uh, holier than the Pope. And, you know, and they are supporting Jamaat and BNP, saying that they must be allowed to participate. Yet, the Jamaat and the BNP don't want to participate. So it's a kind of a, you know, no-win situation for, uh, for both sides. So they, they kept away. Nilotpal, you think the Indian, the Indian government had any, could have played any role in, the, in, in convincing the Western parts that, you know, to keep to keep away from this from this and allow Bangladeshis to do what they what they thought right. That is the tragedy of the Indian government, Girish. The <laughs> Indian government, much as they would like to claim publicly, they have very little leverage with the West. And if you see what has happened in Bangladesh is in a way an extension of what is happening in much of the Middle East that you see the spectacle of uh, uh, CIA and uh, Al-Qaeda ranks uh, fighting shoulder to shoulder in uh, Syria <coughs> and uh, ultimately damage being done to themselves. So the same thing. Now they are saying that even Jamaat, somehow they should uh, uh, be accommodated to participate while the country uh, Bangladesh, uh, it is a sovereign country, it has in a sovereign manner decided uh, through the judicial process that uh, Jamaat can be, cannot be part of the politics. And you see all these war criminals, how is it that uh, such a coincidence that all of their leaders are only war criminals? And uh, therefore, and Pakistan uh, also tries to meddle with uh, and they uh, resolve in their parliament that uh, it is not illegitimate. So, actually, the West is uh, uh, legitimizing uh, 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 allegedly uh, uh, those forces uh, with whom they are supposed to have uh, been fighting in the past uh, after 9-11. So okay. this is the tragedy of the politics of the West and uh, India understands correctly uh, as uh, was being uh, uh, referred to by Mr. Chakravarti but at the same time uh, they, they are, they are uh, I mean the uh, asymmetry is so much in this so called strategic partnership that they don't have any leverage. <laughs> uh, Professor Goshal, uh, you know this uh, what uh, Nilotpal is talking about. He says that India doesn't have much lever leverage with the, with the West and that's why they've not been able to convince them to keep out of Bangladesh politics. W was, it, was it possible to convince the West at all? I don't think India could have done it. I don't think India has that kind of a leverage. And <clears throat> West had its own interests in terms of promoting their own strategic objectives in that region. Right. You see, <clears throat> from my point of view, the problem is that you know, the West is supporting this boycott. I could have understood at an initial stage, I think uh, BNP and BNP particularly had a moral ground right. that after all, we are not going to uh, participate in the election if it is not through a caretaker government. Right. But you know, in course of time, the last six months, you know, both BNP cadres as well as uh, Jamaat. Uh, the Jamaat, they have actually initiated a sort of in you know, a series of violent acts. Exactly. And not only that, have practically put the entire country to ransom because, you know, the, practically there was no work and they introduced almost a kind of a one week work kind of a program in Bangladesh. Rest of the other days they had strikes or something of that sort. So the question of supporting such a kind of a, I mean, it is all right to say that we boycott the elections. Right. But if you boycott the elections, why engage in violence? So that is where the problem, that's where the problem lied. Mr. That, 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 and, that, that and, that, the, and it was a I deliberate think, act. I think it was entire, the entire thing is initiated by Jamaat because of its own survival. Why did BNP, fall, own survival. Fall, why did BNP fall, fall a prey to the Jamaat politics? 
because the BNP doesn't have street carders, doesn't have too many strong street carders. And the Jamaat pressurized the BNP to some extent. The Jamaat was also unhappy or is unhappy right. because the BNP generally kept quiet about the war crimes tribunal. They made some noises about not being particularly, that it's not up to international standard. But when the Abdul Qadir, uh, I, I think that gentleman was hanged, Abdul Qadir, Mullah. Uh, Abdul Qadir Mullah was hanged, then the BNP generally kept quiet. So Jamaat was angry with the BNP because if you are my ally, then you better come out and support me. But then Jamaat has cadres, as has been pointed out, and they have a lot of uh, economic clout also. Over the years, they yeah. have developed institutions, economic institutions, with money from the Gulf and various other places, and they have a lot of economic power today. And they run madrasas, they have the cadres, and they have, and they are committed people. So they are the ones who have unleashed the violence. Actually, if you look at the the, the, the violence and the patterns, it is, exa it is the Jamaat which is actually uh, in indulging in this street violence. Uh, Sandeep, yes. what, what, how does the Indian government look at this uh, situation now, now that uh, um, Sheikh Hasina has been re-elected, though, you know, with, in, in, in such a situation? Do you think that the Indian government will be proactive now, will be trying to help her out, help, the, help Bangladesh out of this crisis? You know, they have taken more or less the line that uh, Mr. Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti was articulating that is, uh, there is no constitutional problem in the elections and that they welcome the elections and they hope that reconciliation takes place. But I don't know how it's going to take place because uh, as we have mentioned, there were four broad reasons. One, the rather dodgy way in which the International Crimes Tribunal was set up and yeah. whatever happened. Then fifth columnist in Sheikh Hasina's government who were discovered a bit too late in the day. And then this problem of foreign funded NGOs that is endemic all over our region, mainly Western and uh, Middle East financed. And all this when it comes into a mix, it forms a very heady explosive. And in all this, the poor and the common man is suffering because Bangladesh is the second largest garment exporting country in the world. Right. And uh, industrial activity always suffers uh, whenever there is an unrest, farming right. and fishing and all that can go on. So I really, my heart goes out to Bangladesh, which is already facing problems of economic devastation, for instance, and a large population to feed. And in this era of free market ec economy, increasing aspirations among the youth. So this is a very tough time for Bangladesh and India can do some hold hand holding. But as uh, Mr. Pinakranjan Chakravarti will tell you, it had better be discreet because then the India factor comes into play in Bangladesh and it will be very, very difficult to really roll that back. Nilodpal? How do you see that? What do you expect the gov Indian government to do or what do you hope the Indian government should do at this stage? And what kind of an impact will it have on the relations between the two countries? And, and also Bangladesh being a neighbor of West Bengal, do you see that? Do you see any, any impact of what's happening there spilling out into, into West Bengal and other neighboring states? You see, <laughs> what uh, you are talking in future tense, already that has happened. Mm. The uh, uh, approach of the current West Bengal government over the Tista water sharing treaty and the transfer of enclaves was not as innocent as you think. And uh, the, the uh, inclination of the current uh, West Bengal government with the fundamentalist in the state and uh, their uh, uh, relation with the uh, Jamaat in uh, Bangladesh is quite well known. So India has a grave uh, interest in what is happening in Bangladesh. And I more or less agree with Sandeep that we have to recognize that there has to be this uh, relentless uh, uh, attempt to, to isolate the Jamaat in Bangladeshi politics, but uh, it must be left to the secular sections in Bangladesh to fight that battle. And today you like are it or not, a, it is the Awami League which is leading them. Are they in a position to fight that battle? I think they have shown, I mean, through the Shabag movement, there was a very creative intervention 
uh, I think as uh, he was indicating some tr trouble within the Awami League, maybe there have been uh, some um, hiccups, but uh, overall I think, uh, you see, Bangladesh, unlike many other uh, countries in the Middle East, uh, its liberation struggle itself, that legacy, it is a secular, secular linguistic based nationalism and uh, there are people to support that. And as I was saying that Jamaat is a uh, hopeless minority, only 3%, but their uh, okay. strength comes from, as Mr. Chakravarti was saying, uh, from the financial flows, especially from the Saudi Arabia, uh, their, their financial institutions that they have developed subsequently. Uh, and this uh, raw violence, the, the kind of arms that they uh, uh, access and so on and so forth. So a condition has to be created where there has to be some give and take between Awami League and the BMP and somehow Jamaat has to be isolated uh, from the national mainstream. Mr. Chakravarti, there is this fear that, you know, all this mayhem and violence and now this, uh, you know, questions of legitimacy of, of Sheikh Hasina government in having been elected in this kind of a situation will actually boost Jamaat again and, you know, it be, there are fears that they may... That uh, and also there's another fear of the army. You know, we have seen this happening in our neighboring in in our neighborhood. The army taking whether in Pakistan or Bangladesh also in the past. So, you know, these two dangers are real dangers. Let me begin with the army first. Yes. Well, I think the Bangladesh army has turned increasingly professional, and I don't think the the it has a it has a tendency now to to you know you know generate coups and stuff like that. The Bangladeshi army, I mean, in fact, during the last caretaker administration, the general, General Moin, who was the power behind the caretaker administration, was the, fir was the first of the, the commission of the Bangladesh Military Academy. Right. And uh, they were, I mean, the current crop of generals are all commissioned within Bangladesh. They are not from the old Pakistani. Yeah, like po post-1971. Absolutely. These yeah. are the first commissioned officers. Hence, those influence of these old, uh, the other old generals who had a Pakistani background because they had served in the army and trained in Pakistan, that is not there anymore. Apart from that, the Bangladesh. So you say they are more democratic in their approach. Well, I think they are. They are more nationalistic. nationalistic. They are more nationalistic, and there are no pro-Pakistan feelings anymore left in that kind of structure. Moreover, the Bangladeshi army is one of the greatest, cont biggest contributors to UN peacekeeping. Right. And that is an important part of their, uh, of their current sort of preoccupation. And they have also changed over time. And uh, the, 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 the old guards have all gone who had pro-Pakistani leaning. So that is one factor. So I am not so sure that the, that the Bangladeshi army is interested in interfering in politics. Okay. The other thing is about the Jamaat, Jamaat. As, to, as to where does the Jamaat go. Yes. The Jamaat has, has uh, economic uh, potential and as well as the street potential to and carry also, on the violence. And also a lot of support coming from various it other will, countries. It will get support from various people and ironically also from Western countries, right. which is the most surprising right. factor because it, it somehow... Is, these Western countries, you know, they are... Hunting with the hare and running with the I, to say, hunting to an, with the hounds and running with the hare. To an extent, yes, and because the Awami League has not perhaps you know played ball with them on certain issues, so they they feel that it's good to sort of support the opposition. Right. And and since it's a neighboring country of India, there are larger geopolitical aspects and strategic aspects at play here. But uh, the Jamaat is not going to give up. I think because they have the potential to create trouble right. and that trouble they will create, uh, continue to create and, and the that, BNP will... And you expect that to spill over into India also? Well, I don't think it will spill over into India, but there will be an impact on the trade on the border, the border trade on our trading relationships and of course if they disrupt the economy, then of course it will cause an impact within the country in Bangladesh. Also, I think if the Jamaat, at what happened once the BNP Jamaat came to power last time, the minority community suffered. They were attacked right. and many people fled from Bangladesh. If that happens, then India will have to take a much stronger position right. on these issues. Yes, Professor Gushan. You know, I agree with Mr. Chakravarti that uh, the army will not intervene in politics because Hasina herself also has taken care of the armed forces 
for one thing is the peacekeeping operations, right. where Army's corporate interests are taken care of. And secondly, you know, Army has also got recently, you know, some arms from Soviet Union, uh, Russia, plus some construction projects. The Navy has been promised two submarines from China. So their corporate interests are taken care of. But you know, what worries me in Bangladesh, particularly in the context of the violence that is taking place now, with Jamaat almost in the, I mean, taking the lead, is, you know, the combination of this radical Islamic forces together with some elements of the armed forces. Because, you know, the that recruitment pattern. That some people have you know, a fear. No, but you see, the thing is that uh, the recruitment pattern, I mean, the Pakistani influence is no longer there in the uh, Bangladesh army. But what is happening today in the recruitment pattern, whereas earlier the armed forces officer stars used to come from a certain elite class of, I mean, people. But today the recruitment pattern has changed. It is coming mostly from the rural background, rural areas. So they are the more influence of the Jamaat as well as the Islamic forces are quite strong. So maybe after about five or six years time, you will have a crop of officers in the Bangladesh army who is ideologically are very close more, to Jamaat. More attuned to the Jamaat. Jamaat as well as the radical Islamic forces. Okay. And that combination might be, might present not only a threat to Bangladesh's own secularism and stability, but also to the security of India. That's very interesting. Both uh, Nilotpal and uh, Sandeep, Sandeep, first, first you, you know, this aspect what both Mr. Uh, Chakravarti and Mr. Professor Goshal says, you, you see that as a potential threat in the future? Well, uh, first of and all, has, has the Indian government taken note of these kind of situations which could emerge in the future? Yes, that's why India cannot sit on its haunches. It has to have a three-pronged approach. One prong would be confidence-building measures such as initiating discussions on regional uh, river basin uh, right. arrangement, for instance, because Bangladesh's main worry is water and salinity. Right. And the second is to complete the ongoing projects such as the 500 megawatt thermal plant that India is setting up in Bangladesh, for instance. Now, if electricity is there, industry will uh, thrive people will get jobs and so they'll be drawn away from radicalism right and uh, of course and along with all this third is regional cooperation we've got the bangladesh china india myanmar project that is right, there right, right. india has certain objections we should not be small minded about it or even be small minded about chinese giving two submarines to bangladesh because at least this will okay. take them out of the grip of the western powers at okay least. Uh, Nilotpal, very quickly how do you see the situation emerging in the in, in the coming in the coming months and years? You see, India will have to be large-hearted because it is too weak in the neighborhood to really be afraid of anybody. It should uh, try to lend a helping hand without any uh, demand for reciprocity because uh, this is really serious. Already from Bengal and Tripura, the information that we are getting, the border trade is already affected. And on top of this, if there are forces in India uh, who see Bangladesh as uh, mere Muslims and uh, draw uh, uh, foreign policy on the basis of that, it will be a disaster. So okay. I think India has to take a very balanced approach okay. and uh, try and see that the Bangladeshi people can sort out their own problems. Okay, I think on that note we need to end. It's a very interesting situation which needs a very close watch in the coming days and months. As all my guests say that India needs to take a more large-hearted approach towards Bangladesh and help it to overcome the problems. We'll wait and watch what happens there. Thanks to all my guests, Mr. Mr. Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, Dr. Baladas Goshal, Nilotpal Basu and Sandeep Dikshit. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue in the big picture same time tomorrow.